Where's ever that puts it? He said. It'll be all right. They knew how to build the nest before they came out of the egg. Get on with it, lad. Has got no time to lose. Oh, I do like to hear you talk to him, Mary said, laughing delightedly. Ben Weatherstaff scolds him and makes fun of him, and he hops about and looks as if he understood every word, and I know he likes it. Ben Weatherstaff says he's so conceited he would rather have stones thrown at him than not to be noticed. Dickon laughed too and went on talking. The noses won't trouble thee, he said to the robin. Us is near being wild things ourselves. Us is nest building too, bless thee. Look out that doesn't tell on us. And though the robin did not answer, because his beak was occupied, Mary knew that when he flew away with his twig to his own corner of the garden, the darkness of his dew-bright eye meant that he would not tell their secret for the world. Chapter 16 I won't, said Mary. They found a great deal to do that morning and Mary was late in returning to the house and was also in such a hurry to get back to her work that she quite forgot Colin until the last moment. "'Tell Colin that I can't come and see him yet,' she said to Martha. "'I'm very busy in the garden.' Martha looked frightened. "'Eh, hey, Miss Mary,' she said, it may put him all out of humour when I tell him that. But Mary was not as afraid of him as other people were, and she was not a self-sacrificing person. I can't stay, she answered. Dickens waiting for me, and she ran away. The afternoon was even lovelier and busier than the morning had been. Already nearly all the weeds were cleared out of the garden, and most of the roses and trees had been pruned or dug about. Dickon had brought a spade of his own, and he had taught Mary to use all of her tools, so that by this time it was plain that though the lovely wild place was not likely to become a gardener's garden, it would be a wilderness of growing things before the springtime was over. "'There'll be apple blossoms and cherry blossoms overhead,' Dickon said, working away with all his might. "'And there'll be a peach and plum trees in bloom against the walls, and the grass'll be a carpet of flowers.' The little fox and the rook were as happy and as busy as they were, and the robin and his mate flew backward and forward like tiny streaks of lightning. Sometimes the rook flapped his black wings and soared away over the treetops in the park. Each time he came back and perched near Dickon, he cawed several times as if he were relating his adventures, and Dickon talked to him just as he had talked to the robin. Once, when Dickon was so busy that he did not answer him at first, Soot flew onto his shoulders and gently tweaked his ear with his large beak. When Mary wanted to rest a little, Dickon sat down with her under a tree, and once he took his pipe out of his pocket and played the soft, strange little notes, and two squirrels appeared on the wall and looked and listened. "'That's a good bit stronger than that was,' Dickon said, looking at her as she was digging. "'That's beginning to look different for sure.' Mary was glowing with exercise and good spirits. "'I'm getting fatter and fatter every day,' she said quite exultantly. "'Mrs Medlock will have to get me some bigger dresses.' Martha says my hair is growing thicker and it isn't so flat and stringy. The sun was beginning to set and sending deep gold-coloured rays slanting under the trees when they parted. It'll be fine tomorrow, said Dickon. 
I'll be at work at sunrise. So will I, said Mary. She ran back to the house as quickly as her feet would carry her. She wanted to tell Colin about Dickens' fox cub and the rook and about what the springtime had been doing. She felt sure that he would like to hear. So it was not very pleasant when she opened the door of her room to see Martha standing waiting for her with a doleful face. What is the matter? she asked. What did Colin say when you told him I couldn't come? Eh, said Martha, I wish that gone. He was nigh going into one of his tantrums. There's been a nice to do all afternoon to keep him quiet. He will watch the clock all the time. Mary's lips pinched themselves together. She was no more used to considering other people than Colin was, and she saw no reason why an ill-tempered boy should interfere with the things she liked best. She knew nothing about the pitifulness of people who had been ill and nervous, and who did not know that they could control their tempers and need not make other people ill and nervous too. When she had had a headache in India, she had done her best to see that everybody else also had a headache, or something quite as bad. And she felt she was quite right. But of course now she felt that Colin was quite wrong. He was not on his sofa when she went into his room. He was lying flat on his back in bed, and he did not turn his head toward her as she came in. This was a bad beginning, and Mary marched up to him with her stiff manner. Why didn't you get up? she said. I did get up this morning when I thought you were coming, he answered without looking at her. I made them put me back in bed this afternoon. My back ached and my head ached, and I was tired. Why didn't you come? I was working in the garden with Dickon, said Mary. Colin frowned and condescended to look at her. I won't let that boy come here if you go and stay with him instead of coming to talk to me, he said. Mary flew into a fine passion. She could fly into a passion without making a noise. She just grew sour and obstinate and did not care what happened. If you send Dickon away, I'll never come to this room again, she retorted. You'll have to if I want you, said Colin. I won't, said Mary. I'll make you, said Colin. They shall drag you in. Shall they, Mr. Rajah, said Mary fiercely. They may drag me in, but they can't make me talk when they get me here. I'll sit and clench my teeth and never tell you one thing. I won't even look at you. I'll stare at the floor. They were a nice, agreeable pair as they glared at each other. If they had been two little street boys, they would have sprung at each other and had a rough and tumble fight. As it was, they did the next thing to it. You are a selfish thing, cried Colin. What are you, said Mary. Selfish people Always say that. Anyone who is selfish who doesn't do what they want. You're more selfish than I am. You're the most selfish boy I ever saw. I'm not, snapped Colin. I'm not as selfish as your fine dickon is. He keeps you playing in the dirt when he knows I am all by myself. He's selfish if you like. Mary's eyes flashed fire. He's nicer than any other boy that ever lived, she said. He's, he's like an angel. 
It might sound rather silly to say that, but she did not care. A nice angel, Colin sneered ferociously. He's a common cottage boy off the moor. He's better than a common Raja, retorted Mary. He's a thousand times better. Because she was the stronger of the two, she was beginning to get the better of him. The truth was that he had never had a fight with anyone like himself in his life, and, upon the whole, it was rather good for him, though neither he nor Mary knew anything about that. He turned his head on his pillow and shut his eyes, and a big tear was squeezed out and ran down his cheek. He was beginning to feel pathetic and sorry for himself, not for anyone else. I'm not as selfish as you, because I'm always ill, and I'm sure there is a lump coming on my back. And I'm going to die besides. You're not, contradicted Mary unsympathetically. He opened his eyes quite wide with indignation. He had never heard such a thing said before. He was at once furious and slightly pleased if a person could be both at once. I'm not he cried. I am. You know I am. Everybody says so. I don't believe it, said Mary sourly. You just say that to make people sorry. I believe you're proud of it. I don't believe it. If you were a nice boy, it might be true, but you're not. You're nasty. In spite of his invalid back, Colin sat up in bed in quite a healthy rage. Get out of the room, he shouted, and he caught hold of his pillow and threw it at her. He was not strong enough to throw it far, and it only fell at her feet, but Mary's face looked as pinched as a nutcracker. I'm going, she said. And I won't come back. She walked to the door, and when she reached it, she turned round and spoke again. I was going to tell you all sorts of nice things, she said. Dickon brought his fox and his brook, and I was going to tell you about them. Now I won't tell you a single thing.